Marxism is a method of socio-economic analysis that frames capitalism through the paradigm of exploitation, analyzes class relations and social conflict using a materialist interpretation of historical development, and takes a dialectical view of social transformation. It originates in the works of 19th century German philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Marxism uses a methodology known as historical materialism to analyze and critique the development of capitalism and the role of class struggles in systemic economic change. According to Marxian theory, class conflict arises in capitalist societies due to contradictions between the material interests of the oppressed proletariat, a class wage of laborers employed by the bourgeoisie to produce goods and services, and the bourgeoisie, the ruling class who own the means of production and extract their wealth through appropriation of the surplus product, profit, produced by the proletariat. This class struggle that is commonly expressed as a revolt of society's productive forces against its relations of production results in a period of short-term crises as the bourgeoisie struggle to manage the intensifying alienation of labor experienced by the proletariat, albeit with varying degrees of class consciousness. This crisis culminates in a proletarian revolution and eventually leads to the establishment of socialism, a socio-economic system based on social ownership of the means of production, distribution based on one's contribution, and production organized directly for use. As the productive forces continued to advance, Marx hypothesized that socialism would ultimately transform into a communist society, a classless, stateless, humane society based on common ownership and the underlying principle from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Marxism has developed into many different branches and schools of thought, though now there is no single definitive Marxist theory. Different Marxian schools place a greater emphasis on certain aspects of classical Marxism while rejecting or modifying other aspects. Many schools of thought have sought to combine Marxian concepts and non-Marxian concepts, which has often led to contradictory conclusions. However, lately there is a movement towards the recognition that historical materialism and dialectical materialism remain the fundamental aspects of all Marxist schools of thought. It should result in more agreement between different schools. Marxism has had a pro Marxism has had a profound and influential impact on global academia and has enjoyed expansion into many fields such as archaeology, anthropology, media studies, political science, theater, history, sociology, art history and theory, cultural studies, education, economics, ethics, criminology, geography, literary criticism, aesthetics, film theory, critical psychology, and philosophy. The term Marxism was popularized by Karl Kotsky, who considered himself an orthodox Marxist during the dispute between the orthodox and revisionist followers of Marx. Kotsky's revisionist rival Edward Bernstein also later adopted use of the term. Engels did not support the use of the term Marxism to describe either Marx or his views. Engels claimed that the term was being abusively used as a rhetorical qualifier by those attempting to cast themselves as real followers of Marx, while casting others in different terms, such as Lasallians. In 1882, Engels claimed that Marx had criticized self-proclaimed Marxist Paul Lafarge by saying that if Lafarge's views were considered Marxist, then one thing is certain, that I am not a Marxist. Marxism analyzes the material conditions and the economic activities required to fulfill human material needs to explain social phenomena within any given society. It is assumed that the form of economic organization or mode of production influences all other social phenomena, including social relations, political institutions, legal systems, cultural systems, aesthetics, and ideologies. The economic system and these social relations form a base and superstructure. As forces of production, i.e. technology, improve, existing forms of social organization become obsolete and hinder further progress. As Karl Marx observed, at a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production, or, this merely expresses the same thing in legal terms, with the property relations within the framework of which they have operated hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters. Then begins an era of social revolution. These inefficiencies manifest themselves as social contradictions in society in the form of class struggle. Under the capitalist mode of production, this struggle materializes between the minority, the bourgeoisie who own the means of production, and the vast majority of the population, the proletariat, who produce goods and services. Starting with the conjunctural premise that social change occurs because of the struggle between different classes within society who are under contradiction against each other, a Marxist would conclude that capitalism exploits and oppresses the proletariat. Therefore, capitalism will inevitably lead to a proletarian revolution. Marxian economics and its proponents view capitalism as economically unsustainable and incapable of improving the living standards of the population due to its need to compensate for falling rates of profit by cutting employees' wages, social benefits, and pursuing military aggression. 
the socialist system would succeed capitalism as humanity's mode of production through workers' revolution. According to a Marxian crisis theory, socialism is not an inevitability, but an economic necessity. In a socialist society, private property, in the form of the means of production, would be replaced by cooperative ownership. A socialist economy would not base production on the creation of private profits, but on the criteria of satisfying human needs. That is, production would be carried out directly for use. As Frederick Engels said, Then, the capitalist mode of appropriation, in which the product enslaves first the producer and then the appropriator, is replaced by the mode of appropriation of the product that is based upon the nature of modern means of production, upon the one hand, direct social appropriation, as a means to the maintenance and extension of production on the other, direct individual appropriation as a means of subsistence and enjoyment. Society does not consist of individuals, but expresses the sum of interrelations, the relations in which these individuals stand. The materialist theory of history analyzes the underlying causes of societal development and change from the perspective of the collective ways that humans make their living. All constituent features of a society, social classes, political pyramid, ideologies, are assumed to stem from economic activity, an idea often portrayed with the metaphor of the base and superstructure. The base and superstructure metaphor describes the totality of social relations by which humans produce and reproduce their social existence. According to Marx, the sum total of these forces of production, accessible to men, determines the condition of society, and forms of society's economic base. The base includes the material forces of production, that is, the labor and material means of production and relations of production, the social and political arrangements that regulate production and distribution. From this base arises a superstructure of legal and political forms of social consciousness, of political and legal institutions that derive from the economic base, which conditions the superstructure and society's dominant ideology. Conflicts between the development of material productive forces and the relations of production provoke social revolution and thus the resultant change to the economic base will lead to the transformation of the superstructure. This relationship is reflexive. At first, the base gives rise to the superstructure and remains the foundation of a form of social organization. Hence, that formed social organization can act upon both parts of the base and superstructure so that the relationship is not static, but dialectic, expressed and driven by conflicts and contradictions. As Marx clarified, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, free man and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight each time ended, either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. Marx considered class conflict as the driving force of human history since these recurring conflicts have manifested themselves as direct transitional stages of development in Western Europe. Accordingly, Marx designated human history as encompassing four stages of development in relations of production. 1. Primitive communism, as in cooperative tribal societies. 2. Slave societies, a development of tribal to city-state, aristocracy is born. 3. Feudalism, aristocrats are the ruling class, merchants evolve into capitalists. 4. Capitalism, capitalists are the ruling class who create and employ the proletariat. According to the Marxist theoretician and revolutionary Vladimir Lenin, the principal content of Marxism was Marx's economic doctrine. Marx believed that the capitalist bourgeois and their economists were promoting what he saw as the lie that the interests of the capitalists and the worker are one and the same. Therefore, he believed that they did this by purporting the concept that the fastest possible growth of productive capital was best not only for the wealthy capitalists, but also for the workers, because it provided them with employment. Exploitation is a matter of surplus value, the amount of labor one performs beyond one what receives in goods. Exploitation has been a socioeconomic feature of every class society and is one of the principal features distinguishing the social classes. The power of one social class to control the means of production enables its exploitation of the other classes. In capitalism, the labor theory of value is the operative concern. The value of a commodity equals the socially necessary labor time required to produce it. Under that condition, surplus value, being the difference between the value produced and the value received by a laborer, is synonymous with the term surplus value. Thus, capitalist exploitation is realized as deriving surplus value from the worker. In pre-capitalist economies, exploitation of the worker was achieved via physical coercion. In the capitalist mode of production, that result is more subtly achieved, and because the worker does not own the means of production, he or she must voluntarily enter into an exploitive work relationship with a capitalist in order to earn the necessities of life. The worker's entry in such employment is voluntary in that he or she chooses which capitalist to work for. 
However, the worker must work or starve. Thus, exploitation is inevitable, and the voluntary nature of a worker participating in a capitalist society is illusory. Alienation is the estrangement of people from their humanity, which is a systematic result of capitalism. Under capitalism, the fruits of production belong to employers, who expropriate the surplus created by others and so generate alienated laborers. In Marx's view, alienation is an objective characterization of the worker's situation in capitalism. His or her self-awareness of this condition is not prerequisite. Marx distinguishes social classes on the basis of two criteria, ownership of the means of production and control over the labor power of others. Following this criterion of class based on property relations, Marx identifies the social stratification of the capitalist mode of production with the following social groups. Proletariat, the class of modern wage laborers who have no means of production of their own, are reduced to selling their labor power in order to live. The capitalist mode of production establishes the conditions enabling the bourgeoisie to exploit the proletariat because the worker's labor generates a surplus value greater than the worker's wages. Bourgeoisie, those who own the means of production and buy labor power from the proletariat, thus exploiting the proletariat. They subdivide as bourgeoisie and the petite bourgeoisie. The petite bourgeoisie are those who work and can afford to buy little labor power, small business owners, peasant landlords, trade workers. Marxism predicts that the continual reinvention of the means of production eventually would destroy the petite bourgeoisie, degrading them from middle class to proletariat. Lumpen proletariat, the outcasts of society, such as criminals, vagabonds, beggars, or prostitutes, without any political or class consciousness, having no interest in international or national economic affairs. Marx claimed that this specific subdivision of the proletariat would play no part in the eventual social revolution. Landlords, a historically important social class who retain some wealth and power. Peasantry and farmers, a scattered class incapable of organizing an effective socio-economic change, most of whom would enter the proletariat while some would become landlords. Class consciousness denotes the awareness of itself and the social world that a social class possesses and has the capacity to rationally act in their best interest. Hence, class consciousness is required before they can effect a successful revolution and thus the dictatorship of the proletariat. Without defining ideology, Marx used the term to describe the production of images of social reality. According to Engels, ideology is a process accomplished by the so-called thinker consciously. It is true, but with a false consciousness. The real motive forces impelling him remain unknown to him. Otherwise, it simply would not be an ideological process. Hence, he imagines false or seeming motive forces. Because the ruling class controls society's means of production, the superstructure of society, the ruling ideas, are determined by the best interests of the ruling class. In the German ideology, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch, the ruling ideas. The class which is in the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The term political economy initially referred to the study of material conditions of economic production in the capitalist system. In Marxism, political economy is the study of the means of production, specifically capital, and how it manifests as economic activity. This new way of thinking was invented because socialists believed that common ownership of the means of production, that is, the industries, the land, the wealth of nature, the trade apparatus, the wealth of society, etc., and by implementing a commonly owned, democratically controlled workplace, create the society of communism, which Marxists see as a true democracy. An economy based on cooperation on human need and social betterment rather than competition on profit of many independently acting profit seekers would also be the end of class society which Marx saw as a fundamental division of all hitherto existing history. Marx saw work, the effort by humans to transform their environment for their needs, as a fundamental feature of humankind. Capitalism, in which the product of the worker's labor is taken from them and sold at market rather than being part of the worker's life, is therefore alienating to the worker. Additionally, the worker is compelled by various means, some nicer than others, to work harder, faster, and for longer hours. While this is happening, the employer is constantly trying to save on labor costs, pay the worker less, figure out how to use cheaper equipment, etc. This allows the employer to extract the largest amount of work, and therefore potential wealth, from their workers. The fundamental nature of capitalist society is no different from that of a slave society, one small group of society exploiting the larger group. Through common ownership of the means of production, the profit motive is eliminated and the motive for furthering human flourishing is introduced, because the surplus produced by the workers is property of the society as a whole, and there are no classes of producers and appropriators. Additionally, the state, which has its origins in the bands of retainers hired by the first ruling classes to protect their economic privilege, will disappear as its conditions of existence have disappeared. 
According to orthodox Marxist theory, the overthrow of capitalism by a socialist revolution in contemporary society is inevitable. While the inevitability of an eventual socialist revolution is a controversial debate among many different Marxist schools of thought, all Marxists believe socialism is a necessity, if not inevitable. Marxists believe that a socialist society will be far better for the majority of the populace than its capitalist counterpart. Prior to the Russian Revolution of 1917, Lenin wrote, The socialization of production is bound to lead to the conversion of the means of production into the property of society. This conversion will directly result in an immense increase in productivity of labor, a reduction of working hours, and the replacement of the remnants, the ruins of small-scale, primitive, disunited production by collective and improved labor. The failure of the 1905 revolution and the failure of socialist movements to resist the outbreak of World War I led to a renewed theoretical effort and valuable contributions from, from Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg towards an appreciation of Marx's crisis theory and efforts to formulate a theory of imperialism. The term classical Marxism denotes the collection of socio-economic political theories expounded by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Marxism, as Ernest Mandel remarked, is always open, always critical, always self-critical. As such, classical Marxism distinguishes between Marxism as broadly perceived and what Marx believed. Thus, in 1883, Marx wrote to the French labourer leader, Jules Guest, and to Marx's son-in-law, Paul Lafargue, both of whom claimed to represent Marx's principles, accusing them of revolutionary phrase-mongering and denying the value of reformist struggle. From Marx's letter derives the paraphrase, If that is Marxism, then I am not a Marxist. American Marxist scholar Hal Draper responded to this comment by saying, there are few thinkers in modern history whose thought has been so badly misrepresented by Marxists and anti-Marxists alike. On the one hand, the book Communism, The Great Misunderstanding, argues that the source of such misrepresentations lies in ignoring the philosophy of Marxism, which is dialectical materialism. In large, this was due to the fact that the German ideology, in which Marx and Engels developed this philosophy, did not find a publisher for almost 100 years. Marxism has been adopted by a large number of academics and other scholars working in various disciplines. The theoretical development of Marxist archaeology was first developed in the Soviet Union in 1929 when a young archaeologist named Vladislav I. Ravdonikas published a report entitled For a Soviet History of Material Culture. Within this work, the very discipline of archaeology, as it then stood, was criticized as being inherently bourgeois, therefore anti-socialists and so on, as part of the academic reforms instituted in the Soviet Union under the administration of Premier Joseph Stalin, a great emphasis was placed on the adoption of Marxist archaeology throughout the country. These theoretical developments were subsequently adopted by archaeologists working in capitalist states outside of the Leninist bloc, most notably V. Gordon Child, who used Marxist theory in his understandings of the development of human society. Marxist sociology is the study of sociology from a Marxist perspective. Marxist sociology is a form of conflict theory associated with Marxism's objective of developing a positive empirical science of capitalist society as part of the mobilization of the revolutionary working class. The American Sociological Association has a section dedicated to the issues of Marxist sociology that is interested in examining how insights from Marxist methodology and Marxist analysis can help explain the complex dynamics of modern society. Influenced by the thought of Karl Marx, Marxist sociology emerged during the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. As well as Marx, Max Weber and Emile Durkheim are considered seminal influences in early sociology. The first Marxist school of sociology was known as Austro-Marxism, of which Karl Grunberg and Antonio Labriola were among its most notable members. During the 1940s, the Western Marxist school became accepted within Western academia, subsequently fracturing into several different perspectives such as the Frankfurt School or Critical Theory. Due to its former state-supported position, there has been a backlash against Marxist thought in post-communist states, but it remains dominant in sociological research, sanctioned and supported by those communist states that remain. Marxian economics refers to a school of economic thought tracing its foundations to the critique of classical political economy. First expounded upon by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, Marxian economics concerns itself variously with the analysis of crises in capitalism, the role and distribution of the surplus product and surplus value in various types of economic systems, the nature and origin of economic value, the impact of class and class struggle on economic and political processes, and the process of economic evolution. Although the Marxian school is considered heterodox, ideas have come out of Marxian economics and contributed to mainstream understandings of the global economy. 
Certain concepts of Marxian economics, especially related to capital accumulation and the business cycle, such as creative destruction, have been fitted for use in capitalist systems. Marxist historiography is a school of historiography influenced by Marxism. The chief tenets of Marxist historiography are the centrality of social class and economic constraints. The chief tenets of Marxist historiography are the centrality of social class and economic constraints in determining historical outcomes. Marxist historiography has made contributions to the history of the working class, oppressed nationalities, and the methodology of history from below. Frederick Engels' most important historical contribution was the German Peasants' War, which analyzed social welfare in early Protestant Germany in terms of emerging capitalist crises. The German Peasants' War indicate a Marxist interest in history from below and class analysis, and attempts a dialectical analysis. Engels's short treatise, The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844, was salient in creating the socialist impetus in British politics. Marx's most important works on social and political theory include The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, The Communist Manifesto, The German Ideology, and those chapters of Das Kapital dealing with the historical emergence of capitalist and proletarians from pre-industrial English society. Marxist historiography suffered in the Soviet Union as the government requested overdetermined historical writing. Notable histories include the short course history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, published in the 1930s, which was written in order to justify the nature of Bolshevik party life under Joseph Stalin. A circle of historians inside the Communist Party of Great Britain formed in 1946. While some members of the group, most notably Christopher Hill and E.P. Thompson, left the CPGB after the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, the common points of British Marxist historiography continued in their works. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class is one of the works most commonly associated with the group. Eric Hobswam's Bandits is another example of this group's work. C.L.R. James was also a great pioneer of the history from below approach. Living in Britain when he wrote his most notable work, The Black Jacobins, he was an anti-Stalinist Marxist and so outside of the CPGB. In India, B.N. Dada and D.D. Kasambi are considered the founding fathers of Marxist historiography. Today, the senior most scholars of Marxist historiography are R.H. Sharma, Irfan Habib, Romila Thapar, D.N. Ja, and K.N. Panikkar, most of whom are now over 75 years old. Marxist literary criticism is a loose term describing literary criticism based on socialist and dialectical theories. Marxist criticism views literary works as reflections of the social institutions from which they originate. According to Marxists, even literature itself is a social institution and has a specific ideological function based on the background and ideology of the author. Notable Marxist literary critics include Mikhail Bakhtin, Walter Benjamin, Terry Eagleton, and Frederick Jameson. Marxist aesthetics is a theory of aesthetics based on, derived from, the theories of Karl Marx. It involves a dialectical and materialist or dialectical materialist approach to the application of Marxism to cultural spheres, specifically areas related to taste such as art, beauty, etc. Marxists believe that economic and social conditions, and especially the class relations that derive from them, affect every aspect of an individual's life, from religious beliefs to legal systems to cultural frameworks. Some notable Marxist aestheticians include Anatoly Lunacharsky, Mikhail Lifshitz, William Morris, Theodore Adorno, Bertolt Brecht, Herbert Marcuse, Walter Benjamin, Antonio Gramsci, Georges Lukács, Louis Althusser, Jacques Rancier, Maurice Morlo ponty and Raymond Williams. Karl Marx was a German philosopher, political economist, and social revolutionary who addressed the matters of alienation and exploitation of the working class, the capitalist mode of production and historical materialism. He is famous for analyzing history in terms of class struggle, summarized in the initial line introducing the Communist Manifesto. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Frederick Engels was a German political philosopher who, together with Marx, co-developed communist theory. Marx and Engels first met in September 1844, discovering that they had similar views on philosophy and socialism. They collaborated and wrote the works of the Holy Family. After Marx was deported from France in January 1845, they moved to Belgium, which then permitted greater freedom of expression than other European countries. In January 1846, they returned to Brussels to establish the Communist Correspondence Committee. In 1847, they began writing the Communist Manifesto, based on Engels' principles of communism. Six weeks later, they published the 12,000-word pamphlet in February 1848. In March, Belgium expelled them, and they moved to Cologne, where they published the New Rheinische Zeitung, a politically radical newspaper. By 1849, they had to leave Cologne for London. The Prussian authorities pressured the British government to expel Marx and Engels, but Prime Minister Lord John Russell refused. 
After Marx's death in 1883, Engels became the editor and translator of Marx's writings. With his Origins of the Family, Private Property in the State, Analyzing a Monogamous Marriage as a Guaranteeing Male Social Domination of Women, a concept analogous in communist theory to the capitalist class's economic domination of the working class, Engels made intellectually significant contributions to feminist theory and Marxist feminism. In 1959, the Cuban Revolution led to the victory of Fidel Castro and his July 26 movement. Although the revolution was not explicitly socialist, upon victory, Castro ascended to the position of prime minister and adopted the Leninist model of socialist development, forging an alliance with the Soviet Union. One of the leaders of the revolution, the Argentine Marxist revolutionary Che Guevara, subsequently went on to aid revolutionary socialist movements in Congo, Kinshasa, and Bolivia, eventually being killed by the Bolivian government, possibly on the orders of the Central Intelligence Agency. Though the CIA agent sent to search for Guevara, Felix Rodriguez, expressed a desire to keep him alive as a possible bargaining tool with the Cuban government. He would posthumously go on to become an internationally recognized icon. In the People's Republic of China, the Maoist government undertook the Cultural Revolution from 1966 through to 1976 in order to ameliorate capitalist elements of Chinese society and achieve socialism. However, upon Mao Zedong's death, his rival seized political power, and under the premiership of Deng Xiaoping, many of Mao's Cultural Revolution-era policies were revisited and abandoned, and much of the state sector privatized. The late 1980s and early 1990s saw the collapse of most of the socialist states that had professed Marxist-Leninist ideology. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, the emergence of the New Right and neoliberal capitalism as the dominant ideological trends in Western politics, championed by the U.S. President Ronald Reagan and U.K. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, led the West to take a more aggressive stand to the Soviet Union and its Leninist allies. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, the reformist Mikhail Gorbachev became premier in March 1985 and sought to abandon Leninist models of development towards social democracy. Ultimately, Gorbachev's reforms, coupled with rising levels of popular ethnic nationalism in the Soviet Union, led to the state's dissolution in late 1991 into a series of constituent nations, all of which abandoned Marxist-Leninist models for socialism, with most converting to capitalist economies. At the turn of the 21st century, China, Cuba, Laos, and Vietnam remain the only officially Marxist-Leninist states remaining, although a Maoist government led by Prashanda was elected into power in Nepal in 2008 following a long guerrilla struggle. The early 21st century also saw the election of socialist governments in several Latin American nations, in what has become known as the Pink Tide. Dominated by the Venezuelan government of Hugo Chavez, this trend also saw the election of Evo Morales in Bolivia, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, and Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, forging political and economic alliances through international organizations like the Bolivarian Alliance for the Americas, these socialist governments allied themselves with Marxist-Leninist Cuba, and although none of them espoused a Leninist path directly, most admitted to being sufficiently influenced by Marxist theory. For Italian Marxist Gianni Vatamo, in his 2011 book Hermeneutic Communism, this new weak communism differs substantially from its previous Soviet realization, because the South American countries follow democratic electoral procedures and also manage to decentralize the state bureaucratic system through the misayons. In sum, if weakened communism is felt as a specter in the West, it is not only because of the media distortions, but also for the alternative it represents through the same democratic procedures that the West constantly professes to cherish, but is hesitant to apply. Criticisms of Marxism have come from various political ideologies and academic disciplines. These include general criticisms about the lack of internal consistency, criticisms related to historical materialism, that it is a type of historical determinism, the necessity of suppression of individual rights issued with the implementation of communism and economic issues such as the distortion or absence for price signals and reduced incentives. In addition, empirical and epistemological problems are frequently identified. Some Marxists have criticized the academic institutionalization of Marxism for being too shallow and detached from political action. For instance, Zimbabwean Trotskyist Alex Kalinikos, himself a professional academic, stated, its practitioners remind one of narcissists incomprehensible to all but a tiny minority of highly qualified scholars. Additionally, there are intellectual critiques of Marxism that contest certain assumptions prevalent in Marxist thought and Marxism after him, without exactly rejecting Marxist politics. Other contemporary supporters of Marxism argue that many aspects of Marxist thought are viable, but the corpus is incomplete or outdated in regards to certain aspects of economic, political, or social theory. They may therefore combine some Marxist concepts with the ideas of other theorists such as Max Weber. The Frankfurt School is one such example. Philosopher and historian of ideas Leszek Kolakowski criticizes the law of dialectics as fundamentally erroneous. 
stating that some are truisms with no specific Marxist content, others philosophical dogmas that cannot be proven by scientific means, and some just nonsense. He believes that some Marxist laws can be interpreted differently, but that these interpretations still in general fall into one of two categories of error. Okushio's theorem shows that if capitalists use cost-cutting techniques and real wages do not increase, the rate of profit has to rise, which casts doubt about Marx's view that the rate of profit would tend to fall. The allegations of inconsistency have been a large part of Marxian economics and the debates around it since the 1970s. Andrew Kilman argues that this undermines Marx's critiques and the correction of the alleged inconsistencies because internally inconsistent theories cannot be right by definition. Marxist predictions have been criticized because they have allegedly failed, with some pointing towards the GDP per capita increasing generally in capitalist economies compared to less market-oriented economies, others pointing to the capitalist economies not suffering worsening economic crises leading to the overthrow of capitalist systems and communist revolutions, but instead in underdeveloped regions. In his book, The Poverty of Historicism and Conjunctures and Refutations, Philosopher of science Karl Popper criticized the explanatory power and validity of historical materialism. Popper believed that Marxism has been initially scientific in that Marx had postulated a theory which was genuinely predictive. When these predictions were not in fact borne out, Popper argues that the theory avoided falsification by the addition of ad hoc hypotheses which made it compatible with the facts. Because of this, Popper asserts that a theory which was initially genuinely scientific degenerated into pseudoscientific dogma. Democratic socialists and social democrats reject the idea that socialism can be accomplished only through extra-legal class conflict and proletarian revolution. The relationship between Marx and other socialist thinkers and organizations, rooted in Marxism's scientific and anti-utopian socialism, among other factors, has divided Marxists from other socialists since Marx's life. After Marx's death and with the emergence of Marxism, there have also been dissensions within Marxism itself. A notable example is the splitting of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party into Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Orthodox Marxists became opposed to a less dogmatic, more innovative, and even revisionist Marxism. Anarchism has had a strained relationship with Marxism since Marx. Anarchism has had a strained relationship with Marxism since Marx's life. Anarchists and libertarian socialists reject the need for a transitory state phase, claiming that socialism can only be established through decentralized, non-coercive organization. Anarchist Mikhail Bakunin criticized Marx for his authoritarian bend. The phrases barracks socialism or barracks communism became a shorthand for this critique, evoking the image of citizens' lives being as regimented as the lives of conscripts in barracks. Noam Chomsky is critical of Marxism's dogmatic strains and the idea of Marxism itself, but still appreciates Marx's contributions to political thought. Unlike some anarchists, Chomsky does not consider Bolshevism Marxism in practice, but he doesn't recognize that Marx was a complicated figure who had conflicting ideas. While he acknowledges the latent authoritarianism in Marx, he also points to the libertarian strain which developed into the council communism of Rosa Luxemburg and Anton Panikok. However, his commitment to libertarian socialism has led him to characterize himself as an anarchist with radical Marxist leanings. Libertarian Marxism refers to a broad scope of economic and political philosophies that emphasize the anti-authoritarian aspects of Marxism. Early currents of libertarian Marxism, known as left communism, emerged into Marxism-Leninism, and its derivatives such as Stalinism, Coism, and Maoism. Libertarian Marxism is also often critical of reformist positions, such as those held by social democrats. Libertarian Marxist currents often draw from Marx and Engels' later work, specifically the Grand Risa and the Civil War in France, emphasizing the Marxist belief in the ability of the working class to forge its own destiny without the need for a revolutionary party or state to mediate or aid its liberation. Along with anarchism, libertarian Marxism is one of the main currents of libertarian socialism. Other critiques come from an economic standpoint. Vladimir Karpovich Dmitriev, writing in 1898, Ladislaus von Bortkiewicz, writing in 1906 and 1907, and subsequent critics have alleged that Marx's value theory and law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall are internally inconsistent. In other words, the critics allege that Marx drew conclusions that actually do not follow from his theoretical premise. Once these alleged errors are corrected, his conclusion that aggregate price and profit are determined by and equal to aggregate value and surplus value no longer holds true. This result calls into question his theory that the exploitation of workers is the sole source of profit. Both Marxism and socialism have received considerable critical analyses from multiple generations of Austrian economics in terms of scientific methodology, economic theory, and political implications. During the marginal revolution, subjective value theory was rediscovered by Karl Menger, a development which fundamentally undermined the British cost theories of value. 
the restoration of subjectivism and praxeological methodology previously used by classical economists during Richard Cantillon and Robert Jacques Torgot, Jean-Baptiste Say, and Frédéric Battistat led Menger to criticize historicist methodology in general. Second-generation Austrian Marxist Eugene Baum von Bauerk used praxeological and subjectivist methodology to attack the law of value fundamentally. Non-Marxist economists who have regarded his criticisms as definitive, with Gottfried Harbinger, arguing that von Bauerk's critique of Marx's economists was so thorough and devastating that as of the 1960s, no Marxian scholar has conclusively refuted it. Third-generation Austrian Ludwig von Mises rekindled the economic calculation debate by identifying that without price signals and capital goods, all other aspects of the market economy are irrational. This led him to declare that rational economic activity is impossible in a socialist commonwealth. Thanks for watching, comrade. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to support the proletariat who makes these videos.